a pleasure to be with you here today. I'm looking forward to sharing. Kiddos, we don't want to leave you out. Let's go with our kids' sermon quiz, which we review at the end of our message today. See if you paid attention. Pastor held on when riding a four-wheeler, an army tank, a pony, or a rocket ship. You'll have the answer to that at the end of the message. What image was on the screen most often? Was it a blue car, a green boat, a red church, or a yellow submarine? And then, number three, what is the last slide? A picture of a sunset, Jesus on a horse, or a boat and a lake. How many times do we say the word church today? You can tally that up, kiddos, through the sermon. And if you uh, get close, or think you get close, you can see Sister Bev out in the church foyer at the welcome desk for your lollipop for paying attention and following along with the message today. So what do we get from going to church we can't get anywhere else? That's a question we're going to think about a little bit today, and then we'll evaluate the question. I want to share just a couple of things before we pray and get into the sermon. Uh, <clears throat> something that's been on my heart. I, I know that last week our Loving Relationships team presented a message. And uh, on uh, this passage today we're talking about Hebrews 10, 23-25. And I had promised to then follow up and preach a sermon on it. And I've been wrestling with it now, uh, knowing that it was my passage for two weeks, and it's been heavy on my heart. And so a couple of thoughts I want to share before we officially launch. Back in 2013, uh, church growth expert Tom Rayner uh, wrote, the number one reason for the decline in church attendance is that members attend with less frequency than they did just a few years ago. Now that's an interesting thing to think about as we're challenged today with the passage where it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Okay? And then here's another one. Uh, this is an interesting little uh, postcard I saw a few years ago. What's missing? Yeah. So, well, you know, let's make sure that we are not the you are, right? And then from Tom Rayner, this is this year during the pandemic, and he wrote this, five ways churches will have changed one year from now, and he gives five ways. As number one, at least 20% of those who attended before the pandemic will not return to church. Now, he's not just making this up. He's uh, in communication with, with uh, thousands of pastors across uh, various denominational uh, lines, and this is a trend. In the comments below, someone challenged him on this because it was an online article, and so he responded, and he said, you're right, we don't know for sure, but initial indications from thousands of pastors we're hearing over the country, this is actually a conservative and low percentage of what, we're, what, what it looks like pastors think they're seeing. Okay? Of course, this number will vary from church to church, but early indicators point to this level of losses. Some of the former in-person attendees uh, will become digital-only attendees. We're seeing that with a move toward live streaming and that kind of thing. Most of this group, however, will not attend at all. Um, I'm seeing some concerns as a pastor. It's been heavy on my heart for a few weeks. Uh, I, over the last couple of months, I've kind of said a few things here and there, but today I'm going to address it, and I'm going to pour my heart out at the risk of uh, stepping on a few toes, offending a few people, but at some point I, I need to speak and, and, and just... I've got it to say, so here we go. Let me share one other verse with you. Leviticus 23.3. Leviticus 23.3, and then we'll launch into our message today. You guys pray for me. And it was a bumpy ride for first service, so I'm hoping it goes better for second service. Leviticus 23.3. And it says here, Leviticus 23.3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath, is a Sabbath of solemn rest. A holy convocation. You should do no work in it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. It says it's a holy convocation there. We know the Sabbath is a day of rest. And uh, we should take rest seriously on the Sabbath. Sometimes folks take it too seriously and they're too busy resting to get to church. That's not what it's saying. Um, and we know that's the case because it says it's a holy convocation. Have you ever attended maybe a religious institution, school or whatever, and they had convocation once a week? What did you do on convocation once a week? So, well, we listened to someone talk or preach, or we prayed and we sang or whatever. Well, I'm sure you did all of those things, but how did you do them? You did them together. Because convocation literally means we all get together to do something. And the Hebrew word here for the Sabbath as a holy convocation is the Hebrew word mikrah, which means assembly. Sabbath is God's assembly day. When we get to heaven, it says from one Sabbath to another in Isaiah 66, shall all flesh come to worship before the Lord. I'm looking forward to an eternity of worshiping the Lord continually, but in a special way. See, we'll worship God through all eternity and we'll go out in nature and we'll build houses and inhabit them and do all of this stuff on the earth made new, the Bible says. But for all eternity, we're not going to miss a Sabbath of assembling together. To worship our God. 
That's a commitment that really ought to start now. It's a serious thing. It's God's convocation. It's God's gathering today. Day. Down through history, even when Christianity has been confused as to which day the Sabbath is, they've always known what you're supposed to do, at least in part, is to get together on that day. It's God's assembly day, right? And so, I know we got some guests here today. I know that um, th this is a message for our, our regular attenders and our attenders that ought to be regular attenders uh, for the past few years. So, uh, let's get into this. Let's pray. Loving Father... I ask, Lord, that you help this message today from your word strike the right tone. I know I'm not equipped or fully prepared, even though I've searched and prayed. I just ask, Lord, that your words would, would cut and not mine, that uh, your, your word would encourage. And, uh, Lord, we know that you're the great physician, the great surgeon, and that when your word does cut, it cuts to heal and make things better than they were. Lord, Touch our hearts. Draw us close to you. Draw us out from ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What can we get from going to church we can't get anywhere else? Our sermon title today, Hold On. Hebrews 10.23, our passage is Hebrews 10.23-25. Hebrews 10.23 says, let us hold fast the confession of our faith. Hold fast. What does it mean to hold fast? When we lived in Washington, I had the opportunity to buy a horse for my kids. We lived in a, uh, actually on the campus of Auburn Adventist Academy in the faculty housing there. And uh, we had a big backyard in the 17-acre field behind us. And I was thinking I would love to get a horse at some point, And I found just the right horse. So I went and bought it and put it in our backyard. It's kind of funny. The conference president said, do you have a horse? I said, yes. He said, where is it? I said, in my backyard. He goes, okay, I'm staying out of it. I knew I would be hearing from the administration of the academy there uh, pretty soon after that, uh, that question. But it was a wonderful horse. I saw it on Craigslist, just, you know, looking around one day. And I saw a picture. I had a little boy about the age of Jackson at the time, my son Jackson, sitting on it without a rope, without a halter, without a saddle, without nothing, just sitting on the horse. Now, the horses I grew up with, you wouldn't do that with a small child. Because they're going to get dumped. They're going to get thrown off. So, you know, you just don't trust the horse that much. And I thought, wow. I need to go get this horse. So I went and got the horse, and we just figured it out along the way. Uh, the academy made us get rid of the horse, so we didn't know we weren't able to keep it but a few months. But my kids will have always had a horse, and so it was a great experience overall. And I remember that horse I was able to do with Jackson just what it looked like I could on the picture. The girls rode him. They had, uh, rode her and uh, had fun on her. And um, Jackson, he would be in just as, well, very skimpily dressed, little boy in the summertime, in the early fall, and I could go out and put him on the horse, and I would go back and sit on the porch from here to the back of the church away. And he would sit there on the horse, and he would hold on to her mane, and when he wanted her to go, he would kick, and she would go around a little bit, and then she would eat, graze, and he'd kick, and she'd do... And I thought, this is wonderful. This is great. Well, we'd put up an electric fence because, you know, how do you put a horse in a backyard with no fence? So we just, you know, stretch a couple of strands of wire and ordered an electric fence kit off of Amazon, hooked it up, and we're good to go. Well, it went pretty good, and the horse knew where her boundaries were, but one day when she was close to the fence, Jackson sitting on her, holding on to her mane, he gave her a good kick, and she took a step into that fence. And she had a good jolt. And, and she just took a couple of, you know, uh, hopping steps to get away from it. No big deal. Jackson held on for dear life. He didn't fall off. And um, I think he thought it was fun. Hold on. The Bible says in Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. The Bible tells us we need to hold on. Now the very fact that the Bible says we need to hold on tells us we may be in for a bumpy ride. Hold on. Did you know the devil has a plan to get you and your family not attending church regular anymore? Yeah, he's got a plan for that. You say, well, you think COVID-19 is part of that? Well, that could be, and it could be any number of things. But the one thing that we do know is God has seen the end of time coming, and as we approach it, He's told us we need to hold on. We need to hold on. So what do we get from going to church that we can't get from anywhere else? It says, let us hold fast the profession or, of our faith. The New King James says the confession of our hope. The Old King James says the profession of our faith. 
What is it we profess to believe? Of course, the Bible is God's inspired Word. The whole Bible. Old Testament and New Testament. And of course, uh, Jesus as our Savior. And uh, dying on the cross for our sins. Being resurrected. We serve a living Savior in heaven right now preparing a place for us. Biblical creation. And, and the fact that Jesus is coming again and He's going to set everything that's wrong right and establish His kingdom. We profess these things, and, and most churches have a commitment that people make as part of their profession of faith when they join a church. And in here, part of our baptismal commitment is to be here at church. That's part of the commitment that we made when we became part of the church. So what do we get from going to church we can't get from anywhere else? It says, let us hold fast the, to the profession of our faith without wavering. Okay, Without wavering is what it says. What is wavering? Do you know what wavering is? We're to hold fast to the profession of our faith, but we're not to waver when we do so. So what is wavering? Kind of back and forth, right? Uh, what would wavering look like when it comes to the topic of church attendance? I don't know if I'm going this week. All right? That, that would be wavering. Okay. Now, so without wavering, what's the opposite of wavering? Thesaurus.plus says... The opposite of it is resolution, determination, unchanging, decisive, confidence, decisiveness, firmness, resoluteness. So instead of wavering, perhaps we should hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, more like, like those words, perhaps. So what do we get from going to church we can't get anywhere else? It says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful who promised. He is faithful. One of the reasons we can hold on with confidence, if we know if we hold on, He's going to pull us through. He is faithful. We know as we hold on, He's coming soon. He's coming back. You know, I, I learned to water ski a little bit, and I, I learned late in life, and I was always gangly and awkward out there. And, uh, you know, I've seen people, and they, they just look natural out there on water skis. Like, I've seen video of me on water skis, and it's nothing you don't want to just delete. You want to just delete it really quick. Okay, it's, it's, it's horrible. But one of the things I, I learned uh, is uh, as I thought I was about to fall, I would just let go. And of course, that would guarantee I would fall. And someone says, keep holding on. And you won't fall. They were wrong. <laughs> I held on. And as I became a submarine holding on, I eventually realized that to maintain consciousness, I should let go. Right? Right? But I did discover that sometimes when I would hold on, when I thought I was going to lose, if I just held on a little longer, I could regain. And, and that, little, that, that part mattered. Well, we're to hold fast to the confession of our faith without wavering. He is faithful. He's the one that's promised to give us sure footing. He's the one that's promised to carry us through. He's the one that's promised not to let us have more on our plate than we can deal with. To somehow carry us through the trials and problems we face. And so... We're to hold on. And we're to know that when we hold on, it's going to be okay because He is faithful. He is faithful. So what do we get from going to church we can't get anywhere else? Well, that's a question I wrestled with through the week. Well, friendship, no, we can get that somewhere else. A Bible study, I'm, you just go to YouTube now, right? Or, or with your Bible. Um, what is it you get from going to church you can't get anywhere community well you know i mean people get community in starbucks these days so wh what do you get from going to church you can't get anywhere else what if that's the wrong question perhaps this might be a question what can we give at church we can't give anywhere else I think, you know, uh, President Kennedy's speech, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That's right. Here's, what, here's some of the things I can, I can give at church I can't give anywhere else. Okay? I can try to be an encouragement to Maryland at church. I don't see Maryland anywhere else. 
I can try to figure out if, if Roger has had a tough week here at church. I don't regularly see Roger anywhere else, right? And, uh, you know, I can listen to Frank if he's got something he needs to talk about today. I can do that here today. And uh, perhaps I can connect with Justin if, if, you know, I know lots are going on, we're busy and coming in and out of church, but maybe there's a moment where we can connect. Maybe, maybe I can say a word that will be an encouragement to a believer in the family of God. Maybe coming to church is like, I can't afford to miss this gathering of my family because I care too much about my family. I need to make sure they're okay. And if they need propped up, picked up, or anything else, I've got to be there because I need to do that. You see, the next verse says, verse 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. This is the heart of the issue. Considering one another. When I'm getting up on Sabbath morning and I go, I don't know if I'm going to make it today. I, I, am I thinking about everyone else in the congregation and that I'm called to go and care and share? That's the heart of the issue. I know I'm, I'm risking offending some people today, but I'm pouring out my heart. I, I've got it to do. We live in a culture and a time right now and with the pandemic that it's predicted that churches are going to lose 20% of their attendance minimum. You say, well, who cares about numbers? Numbers aren't the issue. Numbers represent people. People are the issue. There's perhaps young families that have kids or are going to have kids that are getting out of the habit of attending church now whose kids aren't going to grow up being introduced to Jesus at church. It's got to be taken on. It's got to be challenged at least. We've got to do what we can. Yeah, think about this. My, my grandpa, my dad's told me the story. I never, I, well, I did meet Grandpa Rester. I was two months old when he died. I don't remember meeting Grandpa Rester, but he was a deacon in the Baptist church and he invited one of his uh, friends to go to church. Finally, the guy went on a Sunday night. And he got done with church and Grandpa was a deacon, so when it came time for the offering, they passed the plate. He had to go around with the plate. And he didn't try to notice what specific people did, gave, but he noticed that his friend threw a dollar bill in the plate. Didn't try to notice, you know, just noticed. And so after church, Grandpa asked his friend that came to church, well, what did you think? He said, well, Solly, i got to be honest, it wasn't much of a show. What do you mean? Well, you know, singing was alright, the sermon was so-so, it wasn't much of a show. Grandpa looked at the guy and said, what kind of entertainment did you expect for a dollar? <laughs> when we come to the church, like we're coming to the show, and we put a dollar in the offering plate, like we're paying for the entertainment, in most cases, we're predestined to leave disappointed because we came with a consumer mentality. Which isn't biblical. What can we give at church? We can't give anywhere else. You can pour yourself and your effort and your love and your care and concern into loving relationships in God's family. That's what you can give at church. You can't give anywhere else. And so it says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. In fact, it says in the New King James here, to stir up. To stir up. Let me, let me get right here to it. I know exactly on the page where it's going to be. It's right here. Oh, I close it again. It's okay. It just got rebound. i got to get used to that. It's a little tighter. Okay, there. It says here, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. You see, we've got a responsibility to each other to stir up love and good works. Now, my mom, a few times, called me over when I was growing up. She had something cooking on the stove. Hiram, come stir this. I hated when she did that. In fact, I suspect it was something that needed stirred, and she just didn't want to stir it, and she thought, I can have him do it and go do something else. And I knew if I stopped, whatever it was was going to get that little burnt scorch taste in it, and she's going to know, and everybody's going to know, I didn't stir it good. Because she left me to stir it. So I had to stir. So I, I, remember, I remember this. To stir up. 
But I remember it was work. And here's what I'm going to tell you. If you're going to consider others to, to stir up love and good works, you've got to put forth a little effort. It's going to take a little effort. And then it says, forsake not the assembling, verse 25. Forsake not, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. And so, assembly. Not forsaking the assembly, as the manner of some is. Now, this verse doesn't specifically mention Sabbath keeping. You say you can assemble any time and be with God's family any time they're gathered. And I would say that's correct. You can come to midweek service. You can come, uh, you can have a small group, Bible study, an in-home Bible study group, a group of people that you're connecting with. But I would also add that that word assembly, if you look in the Old Testament for where God talks about assembly, you come face to face with Leviticus 23.3, which we read, where God's assembly day is Sabbath day. So I think it, it includes more than Sabbath, but to say that church attendance on Sabbath is important and we can talk about it from this verse is honest with the passage. And so, as we look here, I want you to understand Satan has a plan to get you and your family out of church attendance. Could it be the pandemic? No. Now, some of you are sitting at home watching you know, the live stream right now and saying, is, is he preaching at me today? No, that's not my intent. We're thankful for what modern technology allows us to do and to reach people, especially folks that need to stay in and especially folks that, for whatever reason, are at home today. We would certainly rather you get on and watch and be there. Absolutely. The pandemic, is the pandemic part of Satan's plan to get you and your family out of church? He could use it that way. Church growth experts are certainly predicting it's going to affect churches that way. And you know, I'm here to tell you that we want to be serious about keeping people safe. We have our 9 a.m. safer service. We keep our mask on for the whole time. We fumigate the, that's not the right term, but fumigate the building on Friday so that it kills the stuff. Right, and uh, we we take hand sanitizer to come in and get our temperature checked, and so and it's about 15 people, and they're spread out throughout the sanctuary where you know you could toss hand grenades and no one would get hit, and so it's a it's a safer service. We're not saying it's safe service; we can't guarantee anything, but it's it's a it's an effort, and so we've created an environment where we do believe that anybody that's going out of their house ought to be able to come to church. We don't even sing. By the way, singing is one of the worst ways to spread stuff. Because when you sing, unbeknownst to you, little particles are coming out, little damp particles are coming out of your mouth and floating around. So the building's been freshly fumigated, still the wrong term, but the right term's not coming to mind. And uh, we don't even sing. And so we want to encourage you to be at church if you can. Now, if you're saying I'm staying completely isolated and I'm not getting around anybody, that's understandable. But I believe there's some things you can give at church you can't give at home. You might get as much at home as you do at church, but I don't think you can give the same thing. Satan has a plan to get you and your family out of church. Uh, I used to tell people, people would say, this was a common thing before live streaming, people would say, oh, I have my TV church. As I would travel around the country as an itinerant speaker, people, I'll have my TV church when I'd get to, you know, in an evangelistic series talking about church attendance. And I would tell them as candidly, but as direct as I knew how, because I was about to leave town and wouldn't ever get a chance again, is that's not your TV church, it's your TV set. You need to turn it off and go to church. Because there's things you can give if you're physically able to be at church. You can't give at home. In the context of church attendance, it says let us consider one another. And so it's the considering one another. It's going to come back around in the next, next verse. This next verse. Another thing, when I pastored a church in western Washington, it would rain for nine months out of the year. The first sunny spring day, and I told them this in first service, the difference in church attendance was like it is right now and then early service. It'd go from looking like, you know, pretty full. I realize we're, we're pretty full considering every other row is empty right now. Okay? It would go from pretty full to 15, 20 people at, at, at a church larger than it. It was crazy. People wanted to get out in nature. I understand that. Of course, I had to go to church. I'm the pastor. Sure. But, 
you know, I had, I've also had to wrestle. I've, I wrestle with this. And my understanding is part of biblically keeping the Sabbath. And you may or may not be a, a Sabbath observer. I know we got guests here today. But biblically, Sabbath observance, part of it is God's made it His assembly day. Now, whether you're going to say, does that mean every single week? Or does that mean pretty regular? Okay, study it out. Check it out for yourself. I've got a biblical example of in heaven that every Sabbath for all eternity we're going to come together to worship. And that's His assembly day. I think taking our church attendance seriously is important. I think if stuff comes up in the week, that planning, if, if trips are happening, other things, planning so that we are at church, and if we can't be at our home church, we're somewhere at church on Sabbath, I believe there's a biblical precedent to it personally. And as I've been trying, I, I was studying this week going, I want to give them a pass this week. You know, we've got COVID. We got, so for two weeks I've been studying the passage and now I've come face to face with, and you know, I, my wife and I go on trips sometime with the kids. We, we haven't always gone when we're traveling and stuff on Sabbath. Okay, so I've just been, as I've studied it, especially when I went to Isaiah 66 and they're in heaven and one Sabbath to another, all flesh comes to worship. I'm thinking, you know what? We need to guard against beginning to slip in this area. So whether, whether you take it to mean most of the time or all the time, study it out for yourself. I, I can't tell you, tell you what to do there. And, and wouldn't if I could. What can we give at church? We can't give anywhere else. What can we give at church we can't give anywhere else? It says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Now that as the manner of some is means this is going to be an issue. God looked down to the very end of time and He said, hold on, hold on tight. Because there's going to be a tendency to think assembling together is not as important as it's always been. Hold on. Exhort, and it says there, exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So, do not forsake the assembling. There are going to be a lot that do, as the manner of some is. Exhort one another as you see the day approaching. Let's just break that down real quick. Okay. First of all, this is one of those exhorting sermons. They're not my favorite kind to give. But exhort means to encourage with strong admonition or appeal. The irony of a sermon on church attendance is the vast majority of people that need to hear it <laughs> aren't here. <laughs> but at some point, you've just got to preach it, let it fly, and say, you know, maybe, maybe someone will call them and tell them to watch the live stream. <laughs> right? And again, if, if you are, are, are keeping safe from the pandemic, I, I understand. I want to be sympathetic to that. I want to pray that through with you. I just, I just point you to the Scriptures. I point you to the Lord. And uh, we want to love you and encourage you. We want to exhort you. Jesus has called us to do that to each other. You know, what, what can we give at church we can't give anywhere else? Exhortation to fellow believers. Right? You say, well, I can do it on the phone. Okay. That's great. Watch the live stream and call 15 people as soon as it goes off. And let them, seriously, encourage people. Or five people. Three people. You say, this is my situation. I need to work within these parameters right now because of what's going on. Good then consider one another and exhort people and be creative and be a blessing to others. Right? And so it says, let us not give up meeting together. This is a different translation. As some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. That's that word exhort. Same thing. Encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. So is that saying we should be more faithful in our church attendance as we see the day approaching or more faithful in encouraging one another as we see the day approaching? I'm kind of going with both. I'm kind of going with both. Do you see the day approaching? I'm just curious. I mean, I look at what's going on. You say, is COVID-19 a fulfillment of prophecy? In part, because the Bible says there will be wars and rumors of wars. Have you heard anything about wars or rumors of them lately? Uh, then it says there will be famines 
And uh, they're predicting even now as we, we head into winter and, and around the world that the pandemic is going to cause massive famine. I was actually, for something else, I was speaking on quoting that the other day. I don't have it with me today. And then, so famine, pestilence. Pestilence is disease. Is COVID a disease? It is a partial flu. I'm not going to hang my hat and say COVID is the sign. But I will tell you COVID is a sign. Okay? As you see the day approaching. Earthquakes in diverse or different places and all over. I mean, there are places now we're hearing about earthquakes happening on a regular basis. It's like, you know, a generation ago, it's like, earthquake there? What are you talking about? And then it says all these are the beginning of the labor pains in verse 8 of Matthew 24. The labor pains, that's like contractions. Uh, that is contractions, not like contractions. Okay, and, and so I'm, I'm not claiming, ladies, I know what that's like. I've observed it closely. As a father of three kids, I, I claim to be an expert at not knowing what that's like. But I do know I've observed them getting closer together and more intense. As we look at the turmoil in our world, the signs of the times, Daniel 12, 4, the increase of knowledge, Revelation 11:18, man's potential ability to destroy the earth. When Jesus comes, he destroys those who destroy the earth. All of these things that I see, I see the signs of the times uh, as those birth pains, and they're getting closer together and more. Oh, there have been earthquakes going back uh, many, many, many thousands of years, right? Many thousands uh, or hundreds of years. Uh, there's been the wars and rumors of wars affecting mankind going way back. Uh, pestilence. Um, all of this famine but what stands out in the last days is they're like birth pains they get closer together and more intense closer together and more intense let us not give up meeting together the reason i think it the meeting together and encouraging one another and that they're both going to be all the more are going to increase as you see the day approaching is typically you need to meet together to encourage one another. Does that make sense? Now, modern technology is kind of spreading that out a little bit. I certainly get encouraged by many of you during the week without meeting with you. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. But in the text of the Bible, before there were emails and Facebook and cell phones, the way that you encouraged one another was by doing what? Meeting together. So... What can we give at church? We can't, or not get. I'm, see, I'm reading, I'm, I'm reading the old question. The question I wrestled with all week. The, the question, what can we get at church we can't get anywhere else? And the fact of the matter is, you can come up with a few things you can get at church you can't get it at anywhere else, but most of the things you claim people get at church, they can actually get other ways. Ask not what you can get. No, no. Ask not what your church can get do for you, but what you can do for the people of God. To be an encouragement. What can we give at church? We can't give anywhere else. It says so much the more as you see the day approaching. I believe Jesus is coming soon. And I believe that Satan is angry and he has a plan to get you and your family attending church less frequently. And I believe that one solution for that is to look around our church family and to realize you're going to have your ups and downs and so are the people that are on the journey with you in your church family. But that God wants you to have real relationships here where the mask comes off and you can be transparent, at least with a few people, if not the whole family eventually. And when you're riding through those ups and downs on the journey of life, there's going to be brothers and sisters in the church that are in a different place. And even sometimes when you're in a very similar place, you can still be an encouragement to each other. And that is what you can give at church. You can't give anywhere else. You can't encourage your church family somewhere else. Kids Sermon Quiz. Pastor held on when writing... Oh my, there's a typo. Here, let's go up. I fixed it on the top, but forgot to go down and fix it on the bottom. Here we go. The main word was missing. 
pastor held on when riding A, a four-wheeler, B, an army tank. That would have been way cooler. Or the rocket ship. But C, pastor held on when riding a what? Pony. That's right. Okay. Number two, what image was on the screen most often? Was it a blue car, a green boat, a red church, or a yellow submarine? A red church. That's right. What is the last slide? Was it a picture of a sunset, Jesus on a horse, or a boat in a lake? Jesus on a horse. All right. How many times did we say the word church today? Sister Bev is the consummate expert on that. She is the one that knows. I have no idea because I don't get up here with the full manuscript. And so Sister Bev, you can see Sister Bev in the lobby and she will let you know. You can tell her what you got. But my friends... Again, what do we get from church? Going to church, we can't get anywhere else. It's actually, what do we give? And that's what God wants to do through you, is to bless His church family. One last thought. I've told the story before, but for me, it was life-changing. And I'm going to tell it one quick time. We'd been traveling on the road in itinerant ministry. We came home to Berrien Springs, Michigan. Libby was at home with sick kids. I went to church. That big Pioneer Memorial Church with about 3,000 people. I showed up and a lady gave me the bulletin. She said, happy Sabbath. I went in and sat down. No one else spoke to me. I started having a pity party. I was exhausted. I had been working. It was one of those mornings where if I was inclined to stay home and recharge instead of going to church, I would have. I'm so glad I didn't. But I went there and I was thinking about myself. I was thinking about, you know, I'd flown in on a Thursday. I was going to fly back out on Sunday and start another series. I was, all, you know, just pushed to the limit with ministry and absolutely emotionally exhausted. And I show up at church and I'm sitting there and no one spoke to me except the lady that had to because she was getting out the bulletins. And I'm thinking, I can't believe this. I mean, you know, 3,000 people, no one knows who spoke to you or who hasn't, even in a church this size, but certainly in a church that size. And I didn't hear an audible voice, but I got rebuked by God sitting right there. He told me I was thinking about myself and that he had lots of other people there at church that day I needed to be thinking about for him. And I got up between Sabbath school and church and I began to go around and look for those that look like they've been baptized in lemon juice, had a rough week, tough time. There were a few. There always are. And, and I began to just try to speak an encouraging word. I prayed with some people. They had a long intermission between Sabbath school and church. So finally the, the music started for church and I realized, okay, it's time to, time to wrap this up. But I would spoke to five or six people other people that no one had spoken to yet that day. Some of them. And I realized as I sat down for the worship service that nothing had changed except me and maybe some of the people God had blessed me to talk to. And yet everything had changed. Because it wasn't about me going there for what I got. You see, if we go and we give of ourselves as God's called us to do, He will see we get something. I don't remember what the sermon was that day. I don't remember anything else about the service, but I remember that God taught me to go to church even where I wasn't the pastor and be a blessing and consider His people He's brought there. And so I try to do that I know, uh, I know, you know, it's my job now and all of that. But um, I want to encourage you. Let us consider one another. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank You for loving us. We thank You for Your sure word to us. Lord, help us to just process on these words of Yours today. And draw us close to You as we look forward to spending time with our family and church family now and in the world to come. In your kingdom that's coming soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.